and I'll be sharing with you a little bit about my personal journey, my testimony, how I uh, became a Christian and learned the things that I'm sharing with you. I hesitate to share this too early on in the program because uh, after you find out about my kooky background, I don't know if people will come back. <laughs> but it just helps us get to know each other a little bit better. And, uh, you know, there's always a risk when uh, anybody stands up and spends too much time talking about themselves that they can uh, squeeze God out of the picture. And I don't want to do that. I've made a lot of mistakes, and I just like to share what I've found in my searching. First of all, let's establish a fact. Everybody wants to be happy, and that's perfectly normal. God wants you to be happy. When God first made the world, everything was good, good, very good. You read it there in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. That's his plan. But a lot of people think that happiness comes from riches and fame. Or as we sometimes say, fame and fortune. Some of the best-selling magazines in North America deal, they're these tabloid magazines, and they're always dealing with, you know, what the rich and the famous are doing. And they've got TV programs that are dedicated to uh, the, the entertainment industry and what the movie stars are doing. Well, I want you to know that happiness does not come from fame and from fortune. I grew up in an unusual family with some very opposite parents. And this is my mom and dad. And uh, how they ever got together, I don't know. They were about as opposite as two people could be. Uh, he came from a Baptist background. My mother was Jewish. By the time they got together, they were both pretty much atheist or agnostic. Um, he was an Oki. That's from Oklahoma. A redneck. Uh, my mother was, grew up in New York City, and she was a, a liberal, and he was a conservative. She was a Democrat, and he was a Republican. I mean, you've ever heard the expression, opposites attract? <laughs> and uh, they had a pretty fiery relationship. Um, lasted long enough for my brother and I to come along, but maybe I'll start with Dad. Dad uh, was very poor growing up. His father died when he was just seven he had three younger brothers during what they call the Great Depression. You ever heard of a book called Grapes of Wrath about the people from Oklahoma that fled to California during a famine? My dad was part of this Dust Bowl migration. And uh, he left home very young, got involved during World War. Well, he learned to fly before the war. So as the war began, he already entered in the uh, aviation business. And he was a captain in the Air Force during World War II. He was flying on D-Day. And a very talented pilot. He not only was an instructor, but he could fly just about anything. After the war, he began to buy and sell airplanes. And uh, he started a couple of different aircraft industries. He really launched the aircraft leasing industry. And a matter of fact, uh, I saw as I was walking through the theater here, they've got something going on about Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson used to rent planes from my dad. And uh, he rented to the military, and he made a lot of money. These are some magazine articles uh, that talked about Dad. Uh, New Miami, uh, he was uh, something of a, a philanthropist. Did very well in the airline industry. At one time, he owned two airlines. Uh, my dad, I just got some papers from his estate that had pictures that I'd never seen before. I don't know if you've heard of the MGM Grand or Kurt Kerkorian, it's a picture of him and Kurt together. They used to work together. Howard Hughes, have you heard that name? All those guys were aviators when they started, and those were some of Dad's uh, buddies back then. He owned two airlines, he had an aircraft leasing company, and made a lot of money. Started in Burbank, California, and eventually moved to Miami. And uh, here's an article, George Batchelor, most president of international air leases, most influential person of the year, is 1995. Uh, again, George Batchelor, Miami's Mr. Aviation. These are just a uh, a few articles I could bore you with uh, scores of them, but uh, he didn't like the limelight, but the people in southern Florida knew him pretty well because he was leasing all over the world. And he had all the toys that millionaires often have. Uh, he had, well, of course, he had a lot of jets. He had an airline, but he had private jets. That's me, believe it or not. And that's um, uh, my stepmother, uh, Betty, is loading up in the plane. Dad uh, used to race cars. That's dad with one of his race cars. He'd race these formula cars or Indy cars. And um, he didn't do too poorly either. He was a, a pretty good racer, very competitive. Um, that's another one. He's 
racing, and he, he liked the fast life and the adventure. A lot of pilots are sort of like that. Married several times. His first wife, and he had a son, died in a plane crash. Obviously, he was not in the plane that day. And, and um, then he married my mom, and uh, that's not my mom. That's wife number three. Um, this is Betty. She was Miss Kentucky. Um, and uh, he married her. Just to give you an idea, uh, some of you recognize this gentleman, um, Donald Trump's second wife, I don't remember, Ivana divorced him. And because she had signed a prenuptial agreement, she was only able to get, I, I think, about $8 million or something. Um, when Betty divorced my father, she had signed a prenuptial agreement and she got $14 million. It was the largest divorce settlement in Florida's history. You'd think with all that money that uh, he'd be happy, but he wasn't happy. There's a lot of stress in his life. It seems like you never think it's enough. You, you, you're driven. You make money and then you end up becoming a slave to your businesses and a slave to your money and everybody's trying to take it and, and uh, it just becomes a very stressful life. Here is my dad with wife number four. And uh, that's my brother, Falcon, and his wife, Sandy. And actually, this picture was taken during my 35th birthday, one of the last times that uh, I was together with my brother. And uh, this is dad with, you remember Pope John Paul II? Just that you, you got to know people if you want to visit the Pope. That's all I'm going to say about that. So my dad was moving and shaking. The presidents knew who he was. Um, he would, well, not all of them, he would donate to certain parties I won't name right now. But um, anyway, all that f fame and fortune, so to speak. And I used to say, Dad, are you happy? He'd say, no, nobody's happy. He was pretty much, depended on what day of the week. He was either atheist or agnostic, depending on how much he'd had to drink. But uh, this is my wife, Karen. And of course, this picture is, you know, maybe eight years ago or more. And dad, she, she, by the way, Karen's a physical therapist. And so dad was saying, oh, he's got so much stress. She said, let me work on your, your back. And she was trying to calm him down. Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Happiness does not come from earthly treasure. You won't keep it. You can't take it with you. You've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You can't take it with you. Dad would go to sleep every night. He would have to drink himself to sleep. He had all the toys. He had one time in the mansion, he had two or three Rolls Royces. And stepmother had a, uh, a Lamborghini and a, a Jaguar and all these toys that people think will make him happy. But I grew up with people like this and they were miserable, most of them. And Jesus said, for your treasures on earth, thieves will break through and steal. Moth and rust will corrupt it. It doesn't last. Dad would drink himself to sleep every night. Had a bar in the house, and, and uh, most of my memories of Dad, I might see him sober for a few minutes in the morning before he went to work. He'd have a drink at lunch, and after work, he'd always stop at the bar, and by the time we saw him, he was very unpleasant. And he just was a very unhappy man, and yet he had all this money. But without the Lord, you can't have peace. You can't have happiness. Now, my mother, on the other hand, like I said, very different. Uh, she's a beautiful woman. Um, Jewish, born in New York, grew up in California. That's my brother and I. By the way, the, uh, the only children that my dad had with my mom was my brother Falcon and I. My mother was in show business. And um, she was a film critic for Good Morning America. She used to write songs for, you know, the people that used to listen to mom's songs or fewer and fewer every year, but uh, some of you maybe remember Andy Williams or Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley. Anyone remember Elvis Presley? Uh, she wrote songs for these different people. When she, she was a film critic in Hollywood, she was very powerful. She was actually the president of the film critics organization that still founded it and was president. And uh, that meant when a new movie came out, everybody was sending her flowers and offering to take her to dinner and everything because if she gave a poor review to a movie, it often meant millions of dollars for them and lost sales. And so it was a very feared and powerful position. And uh, they all knew who mom was. This is mom with, uh, by the way, mom is the one on the right. <laughs> uh, this is mom with George Burns. 
uh, Muhammad Ali in uh, some of his better days. Some of you remember Sylvester Stallone uh, with mom. Uh, I was there during this picture. This is uh, the Three Stooges. You remember them? And uh, they, she actually did a TV program in Canada with them. That's the original Mo and Larry. They had uh, replaced Curly at that point because he had passed away. Some of you remember the Rowan and Martin Laugh-In. I don't know if that ever made it to Australia. But, you know, in spite of all that, so many of these people that we knew growing up were not happy. Matter of fact, you've heard the stories. I'm probably not telling you anything new. An awful lot of the people that are in show business, they drink, they use drugs, they're all mixed up morally, and some of them have money, they've got looks, and they kill themselves either deliberately or in it, unintentionally through drugs or alcohol, and their lives are just out of control. Because so much of this really is about like self-worship. And if you live for yourself, you will self-destruct. The only way to really enjoy your life is to give it away. Jesus said, if you give me your life, I'll give it back to you. He said, he that seeks to save his life will lose it. He that loses his life for my sake, Christ said, will find it. And the, the theme of the world is get it all for yourself. Get as much money. Get as much glory. Get as much fame. Make a name for yourself. You'll lose everything if you live that way. The only way to really have happiness is to lay your life down. Take up your cross. Then you find joy. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. Isn't that right? When mom died, Karen and I were doing some evangelistic meetings in Russia. And we got word, come home right away. Your mom's in the hospital. She had cancer and it, it uh, took her very suddenly. And she died alone in the hospital. It's just a little obituary in the national papers about mom. And that was the end of that. But, um, and, and it makes me so sad. I never really got to say goodbye to her. Because by the time I got there, she was in a coma. Happiness doesn't come from fame or popularity. Well, I already mentioned that uh, mom went back and forth between... Florida and uh, or Miami, I'm sorry, California and New York City. I was born in Burbank, California. That's where dad had his aircraft business. And by they divorced when I was three. Um, like I said, their relationship was very tempestuous. So mom moved to New York City. My brother and I moved there to join her. Um, and you know, we lived right in Manhattan, 81st Street on the west side and uh, 51st Street on the east side. And mom was so busy that we often roamed the streets by ourselves. I mean, I remember being seven, eight years old, nine years old, just going up to 42nd Street uh, by myself and playing. They used to have these penny arcades back then where you could play. Um, my brother was born with a, uh, well, basically it's a terminal sickness called cystic fibrosis. Now, they've done a lot of research, so they've prolonged the life expectancy. And Falcon made it to 35. But he was very sick most of his life. And, you know, it's, it, it was really amazing. He's two years older than me, but you could see we were almost the same height because his disease had stunted his growth somewhat. Falcon had flaming red hair and freckles. We were brothers, same mom and dad, but we didn't look at all alike. Uh, I had no freckles. I had blue eyes. He had brown eyes. I have no hair. He had red hair. And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, we were, we were very alike, same height and same weight when we finally grew up. But um, Falcon ultimately had to go live with Dad in Florida for his health because the air was cleaner than New York City, and he had problems breathing. I stayed with Mom, and I just got into a lot of trouble. Uh, Mom was so busy, single mother, trying to develop her career and working very hard that uh, I began to... Um, have problems in school. I went to 14 different schools growing up, including two military schools. Matter of fact, here's a picture of me at one of those schools. This is New York Military Academy. First new military academy I went to, I was five years old in California. It's called Black Fox. My parents were so busy, they divorced, they didn't, you know, we got in the way, and so they sent my brother and I to military school. I was the youngest cadet at Black Fox Military Academy. It's closed subsequently. This is New York Military Academy. Matter of fact, this is where Donald Trump went. But uh, he was just graduating about the time I started, so we never did uh, do any business together, unfortunately. And there I am, walking around, and I know what you're thinking right now. What a cute kid, right? What happened to him? <laughs> but in spite of... Um, all that was going on, I was always wondering, what is the purpose of life? And ever since I can remember when I was very young, 
Um, because I was going to all these different schools and I didn't really have any religious training, that I began to doubt whether there was any purpose. I was basically taught in the public schools I went to, and I went to public school, private school, Jewish school. When I was living with mom, she wanted to make my, mad, my, my father angry, so she sent me to Jewish school just to go to him. So when I'd go live with dad, he'd send me to Catholic school <laughs> and my brother just to bother. So I kind of got a convoluted. And then I was at military school. They required you to go to services every Sunday. They didn't care. You could go to Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. And I used to hop around the different services and listen. And, you know, it just, none of it made sense to me back then. I spent too much time looking at the people. I'd see the priest up there smoking while he was giving us our chapel lecture and drinking wine. And that never made sense to me. And so I just became uh, very suspicious of religion. I used to think there's no purpose. And I remember that um, I thought, look, money doesn't make you happy. Fame doesn't make you happy. I'd see all the people running around in New York City. They all looked unhappy. I thought, we just die and turn back into fertilizer. What's the purpose? Why not get it over with? Why not kill yourself and save yourself all the grief that people go through? And so I thought about suicide quite a bit, even as a youngster. And I would go to, when we lived in New York, I'd go stand on the precipice of one of these um, high-rise apartment buildings we lived in, 20 stories up. And I put my toes over the edge, and I used to play a game where I'd see how far out I could go until I felt my center of gravity. And the reason I didn't just jump is I thought, what if I live through it? And I'd heard stories about people that fell 10 or 12 stories and lived through it, and they're all crippled up. And I thought... I don't want to be crippled. I want to die. Just get it over with. And I remember one time my, um, I knew my mother took sleeping pills every night. And um, I, she also used drugs along with a lot of the people she smoked. She drank. Uh, a lot of people in Hollywood used pills and hashish and marijuana and LSD and, and cocaine. And uh, that was all happening in our home when I was growing up. And one day I thought, I just want to go to sleep and never wake up again. My brother was at school in Florida. I'm alone in the apartment. Mom's out working. And um, I was 13 years old. I went into her bedroom and, and I dug around in the medicine cabinet. I found these pills that said Valium, take one at bedtime. And I filled my hand with the pills. I just wanted to go to sleep and never wake up. And you know, I know this sounds crazy, but I think one reason I wanted to do that was because I wanted to get my parents' attention. I know that sounds crazy. But I thought, if I kill myself, they'll notice me. They'll miss me. See, they were so busy with their careers, and Falcon was sick. It seemed like he was always getting the attention because he was always sick, and I just was in the way. And so I just about took the pills, and the only thing that stopped me is I looked at the label, and it never said sleeping pills anywhere on the label. It said take one at bedtime. I thought Valium. I was 13. I didn't know what Valium was. I thought, maybe that's a pill for ladies, and I'll get sick. <laughs> So I didn't want to take a handful of lady pills and get sick because I wanted to die. And then uh, it didn't help matters at all that uh, one day my mom said, Hey, Doug, come here. I want to talk to you. She says, You know, you're getting older now, and I know eventually you're going to be running into drugs and stuff out there on the street. She said, I just assume if you're going to do it, do it at home so I can keep an eye on you. And so she rolled a marijuana cigarette with me and, and uh, smoked it with me. And it became a pretty regular practice where mom and I would smoke pot or hash together and uh, eat ice cream and watch TV. And sometimes Falcon would come up to visit from Florida, but because he had a lung disease, he couldn't smoke. So mom felt sorry for him. And so she was a good cook. She would make marijuana or hashish cookies or brownies <laughs> for Falcon. And one time Falcon and I took some of those to a school party <laughs> and we gave some to the teachers. <laughs> Mom sent you some brownies. <laughs> They're really good. <laughs> Made with Turkish chocolate. <laughs> yeah, the teachers loosened up a little bit then, too. But um, so, I mean, I could tell you stories all day. It was just a really bizarre uh, way that we were living back then. But I got into a lot of trouble. This is, that's a, a picture of me about that time. Finally, I started thinking, look, instead of doing something boring, like just killing yourself, why don't you die with some excitement? And so I thought, I'm going to do as many exciting things as I can before I die. 
And so my whole philosophy changed. I just thought, I'm going to see how close to the edge I can get. I started being as crazy as I could be, partly because I wanted people to like me. And so anything my friends would dare me to do, I'd do it. They, they'd dare me to jump off the bridge into Biscayne Bay in Florida, and I'd do it. Or they'd dare me to break into a house while people were still awake and walking around, and I'd do it. I started getting involved in crime. I was now, of course, drinking and using drugs pretty freely, getting bounced from school to school. Every summer, our parents sent us off to summer camp, and everywhere from the Florida Keys to Maine. And uh, I was just trying to find some purpose. I was about as mixed up as any kid could be back during this time. And my, the values I was getting from Hollywood and what I was seeing at home were not helping. When I was living with mom, uh, they were all drinking or using uh, drugs and LSD. When I was with dad, his drug of choice was alcohol. And so when I was with dad, he had a bar in the house as big as any bar that you might find in a city. And my friends and I would drink just about all we wanted. My dad was at work in the mansion there. He had a butler and a maid, and they kept restocking the bar. We'd wait until they were out working on the grounds or something. We'd drink all we wanted. He'd come, he'd check the stock. He'd think, hmm, Mr. Bachelor's drinking a lot. And so he'd just restock the bar. And, and we used to get bored. All these kids, the kids I was living with when I was with dad in Florida, a lot of them were, you know, the kids of millionaires. You've heard of the Hoover vacuum cleaner? He used to play with Sandy Hoover. That was a guy. And uh, we didn't actually play with Sandy a lot because he was kind of strange. Um, he would ride his bicycle up to a stop sign and he'd go, everybody off. And he used to pretend it was a bus. And he always had this dream. I mean, here's the heir of the Hoover vacuum cleaner business and he wants to drive a bus. Do you know what last I heard, you know what Sandy was doing? He was a limo driver. It's true. And you've ever heard of Firestone tires? I used to date Amy Firestone. And so these kids all lived on this island. My dad lived on what they call Sunset Island. It had a guard there and just beautiful mansions and boats all on the water right off Miami Beach. You can Google it and see right where it is. And the kids on the island would get bored. And so we started getting involved in crime by breaking into the homes of the other millionaires on the island. And it's not because any of us needed money. It was just the excitement that we were looking for to prove that we weren't afraid. And so that's where I sort of started getting into burglary. Our friends would go out and they'd say, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? We'd run around the island, we'd jump in everybody's swimming pool, we'd scream Geronimo, all the lights would go on, we'd run over, jump over the next wall, we'd jump in someone else's swimming pool, we just went around the island, pretty soon everyone's houses are lit up and all the police are coming and we'd all go home and felt like we'd done something productive. <laughs> and so we were just, we were very vandalous, mischievous, and uh, got involved in, in a lot of problems. You know what was interesting is we're breaking into all these homes, and the people on the island were sure that there was a band of thieves coming by boat. And we'd sit there and we'd watch these police boats patrolling the island looking for the thieves that were coming and going from the island. It was the kids of the millionaires who were robbing each other. What do you want to do? I don't know. Well, we robbed your house yesterday. Let's rob my house today. I mean, we just, this is really what it was like. We just didn't have anything to keep us busy. Well, the first time I ran away from home, I was 13. And uh, I was in and out of jail, and I'm condensing a lot of things. Um, got into a lot of trouble, drinking and drugs. Uh, last time I left home, I was 15. And I uh, moved up to Boston. I was hitchhiking around the country. Dad said, look, he says, I don't know what to do with you anymore. If things got so bad at home, my stepmother said to my dad, either he goes or I go. And you know, now looking back, I don't blame her because I was really difficult. And so he actually, he owned a hotel also at the time. He put me in the hotel. He says, I don't know what to do with you. And I finally said, this isn't going to work, Dad. I said, I just got to leave. And he's, he was so frustrated. He said, look, I, I can't stop you anymore. So I took off hitchhiking and went from Florida up to Boston and uh, got involved with all the wrong people using drugs and drinking and, and uh, alcohol and stealing. I was now stealing cars. I mean, I'd steal a car and we'd pull up to a policeman and ask for directions just because we thought it might be fun to get into a high-speed chase. And we were just living really crazy back then. And I had a part-time job while I was in Boston. I'm only 16 years old now. 
as a security guard, if you can believe that. Here I am breaking into homes, and on the side, I've got a driver's license that says I'm 18, and I'm walking around feeling like a big shot in Boston and uh, breaking into homes and stealing. And, and I met a friend who was very religious, and he was a security guard, and he found out that I was stealing. His name was Jerry. I said, oh, Jerry, you going to turn me in? I never stole from the places I was guarding because they paid me and trusted me. I had some ethics. <laughs> but, you know, I'd guard places at night and I'd break in and steal during the day because if you walk out of a house with a TV, at night you look suspicious. If you're carrying a TV out of the house during the day, you're just supposed to, you know, act like you're moving. And uh, that seemed to work. Well, this friend told me, everything you do, God sees... And he said, your karma is going to get you. He was into these Eastern religions. And I said, ah, there's no God. I said, I stole that TV and I got rid of it. And nothing happened to me and nothing's going to happen. He said, you'll see. And not too long after he told me that, I woke up in my apartment in Boston and my door was open. And I looked and my television was gone. <laughs> and my radio. And I was mad. I, I called the police right away. I wanted to find out... And I started watching, and everything I did seemed to backfire. I'd break into someone's house, and I'd steal something, and I'd bring it back, and my friends were all thieves. They'd steal it from me. <laughs> or I usually was drinking or, or high when I did this, and I'd steal something, and then I'd hide it, and then I'd sober up and say, oh, I stole a stereo. Where did I put it? And I couldn't find it. I actually, at one point, started tearing boards off a wall to find things that I had stolen and hidden. I didn't know where I had hidden them. Or you know what really convinced me is I would like risk my life to steal something and I'd get back to my place and plug it in and I'd stolen a broken stereo. <laughs> and I said, you know, this is, there must be a God. Finally, something small happened that was very convincing. I went to someone's house. I didn't just completely quit stealing all at once. I started thinking there must be a God and that scared me. So I tried to cut down. And I went to someone's house and I stole a box, a brand new box, you probably don't have it here. It's Krusty's Instant Whole Wheat Pancake Mix. All you do is you add water. It's ready to go. You make pancakes. And uh, on the top of the box, it was stamped. And I stole it because it was whole wheat pancake mix. And I was actually very health conscious back then. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm using drugs and LSD and drinking and staying up all hours and smoking cigarettes. And, but I only use whole wheat pancake mix. <laughs> it's true. I know it's kind of hypocritical. But... Um, on the top of the box, it was stamped $1.19. That same day, some friends came through my place without asking. I had a brand new jar of powdered orange juice I just bought. Tang instant breakfast juice. And the top of the jar was stamped $1.19. And they drank the whole thing. So I get back, and here I've got this stolen pancake mix. It says $1.19. And then I look at the lid of the orange juice, and it says $1.19. I thought, crime doesn't pay. Everything I do was happening back to me. And I said, there must be a God. I could tell you a hundred stories like that. The Lord was letting me know that he was there. So I began to surf around the TV channel Sunday to find out what Christianity had to offer. And I'd hear all these televangelists begging for money and going through these phony, what looked like phony healing services to me. And you know, my mother was in show business. She was an actress. And so I, it was a little easier for me maybe to spot when someone was acting. And some of this stuff seemed a little disingenuous. And for me, the lowest creature on the planet were these televangelists. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? That's what I do now. But I said, they're all hypocrites. Christians are all hypocrites. You ever heard someone say that? You turn on the news, the Protestants and Catholics are killing each other, and they're both supposed to be Christians, and they're blowing each other up in the name of God, and Jesus said, love your enemies. Oh, they're all hypocrites. So I just kept searching. And then I began to get involved in some of the Eastern religions, and I just took off and got involved in everything. I mean, I got involved in Buddhism, tried to learn what I could, and I read about uh, the Buddha and Siddhartha, got involved a little bit in transcendental meditation and Hinduism, got involved in yoga, and I could still do some of those yoga exercises, trying to find out what the truth was. I already had some Jewish roots, so I tossed in a little bit of Judaism. I sort of made a potluck, invented my own religion, because I figured, you know, there's probably some good in all of them, and I'm going to just take the good from all of them and make my own. But uh, my brain was not a very good guide of what truth was. And I, I went to Catholic school, so I sprinkled in a little Catholicism. 
into it and uh, trying to figure out what is truth. And I was very spiritual. I would be in a bar talking about God all night long. Or be high with my friends talking about God. And, uh, you know, looking back now, it's sort of absurd to think about it. During this time, while I was living in Boston, my dad stopped in Boston. He was on a business trip. And he called me and said, Doug, I'd just like to have lunch with you. And, and, you know, I felt pretty important back then because I was working. I actually at one time had two jobs, security guard, and I worked in a factory rust-proofing the steel toes in boots. I can tell you, you don't want to do that your whole life, but that was one of my jobs. Since I worked a lot, I had money, had my own apartment. I'm 16 years old, and I felt like a big shot. And so Dad said, hey, Dad, let me take you out, take you out to lunch. And so he, uh, he came, and I took him to lunch, and he, he said, Doug, you're wasting your life. He said, your brother's sick. He said, I've got this business. I'm successful. He said, you're healthy. And he said, you're throwing your life away. You've got to get an education. Please go back to school. He said, look, let me tell you what I found. He said, you're just living like this in Boston. It's a mess. He said, I found a school. And he said, this school is on a boat. And this is actually a picture I found online from my former classmates. This is the boat. There's actually two boats that sailed together. It's called the Flint School Abroad. Two boats, they sailed around the world. They actually made a movie called White Squall about one of these schools where, but this one was an all-boys school that was on a boat that sailed around the world. That one capsized. This one didn't. And um, anyway, and he said, there's girls on the boat. He said, you get to sail around the world. You go water skiing and scuba diving. And he said, you won't have to work yourself to death like you're doing right now. He said, I'll pay for it. Very expensive school. And he was pleading with me. And you know, I just couldn't tell him no. I didn't have to move back home and argue with the step family. And so I said, all right, I'll try it. So right then, he dropped what he was doing. He somehow, you got enough money, you can do anything. He got me a passport picture in 10 hours and a passport. He then put me on a plane with him to Milan, Italy. Flew me to Italy, took me to this boat, handed me over to the captain. The school year had already started. It was partway through the year already. And um, after he left, I found that I'd been tricked. This school, and it had a lot of what he had advertised, but it was a school for the children of very wealthy politicians and people in North America whose kids maybe were getting mixed up in drugs or some kind of cult to try and help isolate them from these bad influences and to also teach them and uh, straighten them out, set them on the right track. Very exclusive, very interesting school. They taught atheism. Matter of fact, they showed us films of Darwin, talked about what a hero he was, and said there's no God because they were trying to de-brainwash people who had got mixed up in the Moonies or some other cultish religion. And now I'm very religious. I was now going through a religion called Shakti, the spiritual science of DNA. God is in all your DNA molecules. And I was trying to be at one with God in my molecules. And, and um, I was in my cabin. I had a little recorder. I used to play a little flute. And I was meditating. And now everyone's making fun of me. But see, this was different. Because when I went to military school, if you didn't obey, they beat you there. I don't even think they can do that. When I went to New York Military Academy, there were no girls. It was different back then than it is today. Um, it was the strictest school in the world. I mean, so I just went across the spectrum. So now I'm at this free school on a boat. But they can't beat you there. And when I found out that I'd been tricked like this, they take away your passport. And if you get arrested in Turkey or Italy, and there's nothing anybody can do. So they put the fear in us. I couldn't run away. And so I was so mad. I wouldn't go to class. I wanted, all the other students had to like wash the dishes and do the deck and stand watch and all these chores. And I said, I'm not doing anything. And it started kind of disrupting morale on the boat because the other kids were saying to the teachers, Bachelor's not doing dishes. Why do I have to do ditch, dishes? And bachelor's not waking up and standing watch as we sail across. Bat and so they, I, then they say, well, you got to sit on the floor during class. And I'd sit on the floor and I'd goof off and clown around. I know it's hard for you to imagine me being that way. But I was very disruptive. And then they said, all right, well, we're, you're not going to have meals. So I got my roommates to smuggle me food. I was like a war. I was just so mad. Because here I had been 16 years old. I'm, I'm 18 because I've got a false ID, I'm in Boston, I'm living on my own, and all of a sudden I'm a kid again, back in school, having these people tell me what to do. It wasn't a good adjustment. So one day we're in northern Africa, and the captain of the boat, who's also the principal, he comes to me and says, 
I said, uh, Doug, what do I need to do to get you to cooperate, to work with the program? Is there anything I can do? I said, yes. He said, let me go home for Christmas break and I'll be a model student. Now, only good students got to go home for Christmas break because this school was sorted to, it's like a prison. He went right from that, he said, do we have a deal? I said, you got a deal. He went and he called my father, woke him up because of the time difference. So, said, Mr. Bachelor, sorry to disturb you. He said, uh, we just wanted to let you know Doug has shown remarkable progress and we think he's going to be able to go home for Christmas. They wanted to get rid of me. And so, uh, oh, my dad was so happy to hear that, you know. So for two more weeks, I was good uh, until Christmas break came around. And while we were waiting for that, we were sailing from northern Africa. This is a picture of the two boats. It's actually uh, something they had online. We were sailing from northern Africa to Port of Mahon, Spain, across the Mediterranean. Now, I know on a map it only looks that big. But if you get out on the Mediterranean in the wintertime, it's a big sea in a sailboat. Uh, you read about in uh, Acts chapter 27, Paul gets into a storm out on the Mediterranean in the winter, and it was pretty severe. Uh, they've got some big waves, and we got into just a horrendous storm, and water was washing over the boat, and uh, the nose of the boat was going through waves. The waves were like, I don't know what it would be in meters, but like 25, 30 feet. And uh, it's pretty scary when you get this mountain of water coming, and things are washing overboard, and the mainsail ripped, and everybody's seasick. And the captain is seasick. And if you go below deck in the boat, it looks like a great big hand had taken the ship and picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it. Everything's laying in the floor and the halls. And, and uh, what do you think atheists do when they think they're going to die? Oh, they all start praying and making promises. And uh, people also know what they're doing wrong. Because as soon as they think they're going to die, they know exactly what to confess. And people were praying and making promises to God, and, and I probably made a few of my own. Well, when we got back to, um, when we got back to, obviously we survived. And I learned that fear is not the reason to serve God. Because as soon as the storm's over, you forget your promises and your prayers. It might be a starting point, but ultimately the reason to serve God is because you love Him. Finally, we made it to Spain, and they put me on an airplane. Uh, first thing I did was I ordered a pack of cigarettes and a beer. Uh, back then you could do that. And um, I, the student said, oh, you're in trouble. I said, no, I'm not. I said, you're never going to see me again. And they never have. As soon as I got back to Florida, oh, dad did take, as soon as I got back, he was in a good mood because he heard I was doing very well. He took the whole family snow skiing in Canada. Then after the winter trip, when it got time to go back to the school, I sold my brother everything I had, which wasn't much, got some money, and I left Florida. And I took off, took a bus part of the way. I got stuck in, oh, where was I? I was in uh, Roanoke, Virginia. I had been drinking and playing pool, and I lost all my money. Very religious. Got stuck in Oklahoma, and I stood on this, one of the main arteries across this North America. It's called Interstate 40, and you all know what hitchhiking is. You stand out there on the road, and you go like this, and, and you basically beg for a ride. And I stood there for hours. Now, I'm wearing Florida clothing, and it's wintertime. And it's very cold. And it's freezing weather, and I'm just shaking violently. I'm 16 years old. I'm sick from drinking. I've got no money left. I'm all alone on this highway, and I stood there for hours. And you get so desperate at times, I just about got on my knees. I would. I'd go like this. I'd beg when people went by for a ride. And uh, finally I prayed. And I asked the Lord for four things. You know, I, I didn't even know how to pray. I knew a couple of memorized Jewish prayers, and I knew the Lord's Prayer and Hail Mary, but I mean, I didn't really know how to pray on my own. And so, and I didn't really feel right approaching God, because I said, Lord, first thing is, I know that I've done a lot of bad things. But I need your help. And I'm not understating it. I was a rotten kid. I would steal. Uh, I stole a bike from one friend. A friend. Got a brand new, very expensive bike for his birthday. A millionaire's kid. Stole it from him. Sold it to another friend. Who then tried to change the serial number. Paint it. I then stole it from him. 
sold it to another friend. I was stealing cars in Boston one time, and I stole this one car. And a few weeks later, I saw the car was back. You steal it, you know, and you, you leave it wherever you want. You don't take it back. And, and there it was back again. So I went to steal it again. And as I got into the car, I could see the ignition was still out. We used to pull out the ignitions with a dent puller. You men know what I'm talking about. And the ignition was still gone. It makes it really easy to steal. And there was a note pinned up on the dashboard, and it said, please don't steal my car. It said every time it gets stolen. He said it cost me a fortune to, to get it out. I stole it. And it got a flat tire in New York City. And, and uh, everything went wrong that trip. So when I prayed on the highway that day, and I said, Lord, I know I'm a rotten person. I was a rotten, rotten kid. Selfish. I didn't think anyone cared about me. So I didn't care about anyone else. So I prayed. I said, Lord, please help me. I need... I need some money. I was broke. I said, need some food. I'm hungry. And I'm too proud, too stubborn to ask my dad for anything now. I didn't want to go back to that school. And I prayed that God would give me a ride to where I was going. And the fourth thing I prayed for was a ride with someone normal. Because when you're out there on the road hitchhiking, I got picked up by some real zingers. You know, when you hitchhike, they've got a saying, only crazy people and Christians will pick you up. I got picked up by some college students one time and they were smoking so much pot that they obscured their vision of the highway in the cab of their car. They drove across the center divide on an interstate freeway, started heading into oncoming traffic. I got picked up by another guy that had been drinking and he said, on a windy road in California with cliffs, I'm not kidding you, Highway 1. He said, oh, there's nothing, so I can drive with lights off. So he turns off his headlights at night to show me he could drive this windy road at night. I said, what do you know? This is my stop right here. <laughs> so I prayed. I said, Lord, please give me a ride with someone normal. I'd been standing there for eight hours. The next vehicle to go by stopped. It was a white van. The man picked me up. He took me 2,000 miles to the door of where I was going in California. He fed me all the way out. I didn't ask him to. He gave me $40 when he dropped me off that I didn't ask for. I also did not ask him to preach to me all the way from Oklahoma to Palm Springs, California. He was a born-again Christian, and he thought I should be one too. And so he's just preaching away and telling me about uh, the Lord. Well, I, you know, I thought, i got to listen to the guy or get out of the car. And so I thought the Bible was a fairy tale. But by the way, you know, I still do that. Now, it's, it's not a bad way to witness I don't know if you're allowed to hitchhike here in Australia. You ever have people stand out on the road and just kind of beg for a ride? Yeah? It's not a bad way to witness because, and this is what you do. If you pick them up, wait until you're going about 55 miles an hour and then make your gospel presentation and then say, now would you like to accept Jesus? And then accelerate and turn and look at him. <laughs> and just keep accelerating. I've had a lot of people find Jesus in my car in that way. <laughs> But I thought the Bible was a fairy tale. I said, my mother used to say, that's a collection of fables. So now I was going to find God through nature. So I moved up into the mountains outside of Palm Springs, California. This is actually a picture my brother took when he came to visit me one time. Uh, way back up in these desert mountains, uh, there was a cave. I had found it when I was hitchhiking around when I was 15, when I was roaming around the country with a friend. And uh, this is from the top of the hill. I would climb from Palm Springs way up over this uh, desert ridge down the other side in this canyon. This is one day when we hiked up with our, our kids. And this is an 11,000 foot mountain. And I think that's much taller than any mountains in the whole continent of Australia. It's a very tall mountain. And coming down that mountain, you see where the black line is there? Right at the base of that is where my cave was. And it was right by a creek surrounded by desert mountains. It's like a little oasis. And here, here's a picture inside the cave. And I had a very neat cave because I went to military school. I tell you what, I had everything folded and all my little pots and pans stacked up and organized. Right outside the cave, there was a pool of water. That was my cat named Stranger. And it was crystal clear water and you could dive in. And a waterfall right outside the cave. This cat just showed up one day and stayed with me. I called him Stranger. And at night he would... Uh, He'd push on my face when he got done hunting and with his paw, and I'd lift up my sleeping bag, and he'd crawl in down by my feet in the winter, and he'd sit down there at the bottom and purr. Isn't that neat? Boy, that'll put you to sleep. That's really neat. 
But sometimes, you know, a stranger would get into a, a, a battle with like a skunk. I was sitting there once making my dinner, and he came running through the cave, and I looked, I turned back, and a skunk was chasing him, and he had run right behind me. You've never seen anyone move so fast before. So I had a lot of adventures when I lived up there. But the miracle is that when I moved up into the cave, there was a Bible in the cave. And when I first saw it up there, I thought, oh, look at that. Someone left a Bible. This is not the Bible. I thought, that's interesting. And, you know, I kind of thumbed through a Bible before in a hotel room, but I, someone asked me one time, was it a Gideon Bible? Did they put it there? <laughs> you know, they put the Bibles in all the hotel rooms, and then they start doing the caves. After that, I guess, is what they were wondering. It was, uh, I don't know, King James Version. And in the f I didn't even read it, but about six months, I lived in the cave a year and a half. About six months after living there, I kept running into these half hippie, half Christians in Palm Springs. We called them Jesus freaks back then. And they'd come up to you and say, do you know the Lord? Have you been washed in the blood? And I'm going, I don't know what in the world these guys are talking about. So I thought, I better read the Bible so I can argue with them. Because I felt ignorant. I'd gotten into all these other religions and I read widely on all the different Eastern religions. But I'd never read the Bible. I thought I knew about it, but I didn't. And so um, I went back up to the cave and I started reading Genesis and Exodus, and I got a little bogged down when I got to Numbers. And I talked to a Christian. They said, well, you ought to go to the New Testament. And he helped me locate that. And then I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I used to make my own banana bread. I had a little oven I put on the fireplace, and I got these free bananas from the market. I used to dig in the dumpster behind the market. And when I lived up there in the clave, I, I never wore any clothes. I just... You know, there was nobody around, and we were trying to find God through nature back then. I thought, well, this is natural. Now, I put them on when I went to town. I did forget one time, but that's another story, and we don't have time for that. <laughs> but I kind of dig around in the garbage behind the market, and I'd get these old bananas, and I'd make banana bread. It was really good. And I'd eat my banana bread, and I'd read the Bible. And I did this for months. And after reading through the Gospels, and I went to the encyclopedia, and I said, did Jesus really live? I thought he was a myth. All of them say, oh, he's a real figure of history. History's dated from his birth. And I was really struggling because I thought, I've only got a couple of choices here. For one thing, as I'm reading through the Bible, I was amazed at all the sayings. I'd read these things in the Bible. Like when you read in Daniel, it says, handwriting on the wall. I went, oh, I've been hearing that all my life. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Or where Jesus said, turn the other cheek. I went, so that's where that comes from or going the second mile, or casting the first stone, or by the skin of your teeth, or all these expressions that we use. I had no idea they were in the Bible. So as I'm reading the Bible, I went, ah, I didn't know that was in the Bible. This is great. And so um, as I was going along, I finally said, I've got to make a decision. Either Jesus was crazy, or he was a liar, or he's telling the truth. You've only got those three options. I said, well, he can't be crazy because as I'm reading through the Bible, the greatest wisdom of the ages was in the teachings of Christ. And he can't be a liar because he had opportunity to tell the truth and, and save himself if he wanted to lie, but he treasured the truth so much that he was willing to die rather than to speak a falsehood. And just, you know, as you read the teachings of Jesus, it just resonates with everybody. He's telling the truth. So my only option was that he was the Son of God. And then I really had a struggle. I thought, what do I do with this? I read where Pilate said, what will I do with Jesus? And I really heard the Lord asking me that, what am I going to do with Jesus? It's kind of a struggle for me because with my Jewish background, we thought Christians, they're always persecuting the Jews. And you're sort of disowned from your Jewish family if you accept Christ because it's almost like a betrayal. But I said, you know, this is the truth. He was the Messiah. And so I got on my knees up there in the cave. And I said, Lord, I've done everything. I've tried everything. I said, my life's a big zero. And I'll tell you, friends, I'm not exaggerating. You think about it for a minute. You don't get much lower than I was. I'm living like a hermit up in the mountains. I'd go days without seeing anybody. I wanted to get as far away from people as I could because I just couldn't get along with people. And I'm running around naked and eating out of garbage cans and oh by the way what do you think my dad thought when he found out that I was eating out of a garbage can 
when he worked all his life and make money so we wouldn't have to be poor. And then he heard from my grandparents, he had Dougie's eating from the dumpster. Had broke his heart. What do you think your heavenly father thinks when we go to the dumpster of the devil for happiness? And God has paid so much that you might have real happiness. So the only alternative I was left with is I got on my knees and said, Lord, will you come into my heart? Will you change me? Will you give me some purpose for living? And right after I prayed, I know the Lord accepted me. And I felt so excited. I just knew that I had peace and all of a sudden my life just completely began to turn around. And I saw so many miracles, friends. I'd be panhandling on the street and I'd say, Lord, I have nothing to eat. You said that if we pray that you'll give us something to eat. And I, Lord, it'd be nice while I'm asking if we could get $4 so that we could maybe go to a restaurant. A lady walks up, hands us $4 and walks away. I'm in another restaurant. I have no money to eat, but I'm in a restaurant because it's cold out and I'm hitchhiking. I'm stuck. And I pray and I say, Lord, please provide some food. I have nothing to eat. The waitress comes over and says, I'm buying your dinner tonight. What do you want? I just started seeing miracle like miracle. I mean, I could go on all night and tell you the things that were happening. They told me God is real. Prayer works. And finally, one thing that happened, catch this. I'm up in the cave and I say, Lord, this is such good news. I want to tell the world. I, I can't believe you're real and people don't know. And I said, how can I tell everybody? I'm a hermit. I live in a cave. But Lord, if you give me a chance, I'll tell people what you've done for me. So I go to town and I call my mom who lives in Beverly Hills. I used to call her every now and then, collect, because I didn't have a phone. And uh, she said, Doug, are you going to be up at your cave for the next couple weeks? I said, yeah, where am I going to go? She said, uh, I've got a producer from NBC that wants to fly up to your cave and do an interview. I said, what? She said, yeah, I was having lunch with Tom Applegate, and uh, I told him that uh, my son's dad's a millionaire and he's living in a cave. He said, oh, that'd be a great human interest story. So I meet my mom at the airport. They climb in a helicopter, fly up there. This is the news crew in my cave. They videotape for NBC this human interest story, and they ask you, so why are you living up here? And all of a sudden, I've got this worldwide opportunity to share my testimony right after I pray. And it was on TV three times that day. I had to go back down to town and find a hotel lobby to watch it because I didn't have a TV. And um, I know it was on three times that day because one of my friends in jail said, Doug, I saw you on TV three times <laughs> today. And so God is real. He'll give you these opportunities. And you know, since then I said, Lord, I want to serve you. And I don't know how that's going to happen because I've, I've dropped out of high school and, and you know, my life's a big zero. And he just began to work a series of miracles. And they're in the book. And maybe another day I'll say more about it. I've hiked up to the cave several times since then. This is our family going up there in, oh, I don't know, 1999 or sometime around there. Matter of fact, two years ago, National Geographic, at their expense, flew me to my cave in a helicopter to do an interview. And uh, so I got to go up to the cave again to see it. This is a picture of uh, the only picture I've really got. Can you tell I'm the black sheep of the family? My brother's wedding, I didn't even have a suit, so I fly out looking like a caveman, and uh, they just kind of pinned some clothes on me. That's my dad and my mom. Uh, they, that, they just had to grit their teeth to get together for a picture. Uh, they've all subsequently passed away. Um, brother passed away from cystic fibrosis. I was with him and able to pray with him. Uh, when he was 35 in Florida, I told you about mom's passing. Dad, wife number four left him. Then along came wife number five. And as dad was finally dying from cancer at 83, I flew out to Florida to see him for the last time with our son, George Stephen, named after my father. Our son, Daniel, who was in the Marines. He's in his dress uniform. And we went to the gate of the mansion and rang, and they wouldn't let us in. His wife, his new, she wasn't his wife yet. She married him two weeks before he died so that she could try and seize his estate. And they wouldn't let us in to see dad. And you know, that's always been kind of a real sad point. And to see my boys crying at the gate because grandpa wouldn't let them in. Uh, dad wanted to see us, but they, it's a long story. But I'm so thankful that, you know, the Bible says when your mother and father forsake you, the Lord will take you up. And that the heavenly father will never close his door for you. I remember one time I went to see Falcon before he passed away 
and he was struggling to breathe. And my falcon used to say, he said, Doug, he says, life's not fair. He said, I'm so smart and I'm sick and you're so healthy and you're stupid. He said, it just doesn't seem right. He said, I'd give everything I own if I could get a lung transplant. They had not developed it back then where he could have a heart-lung transplant. And he knew his time was, he said, I'd give everything for a little more of this life. And then I think, yet some people are afraid to give up something for Jesus and everlasting life. God gave his son that you, so you could have not only a new life now, but you can have everlasting life. People have thought I was crazy because back when my dad passed away, they said, Doug, you're his only surviving blood son. You can go back and get an attorney and you could take over the foundation and you could have all this money and think of what you could do then. And I saw that it was a big trap. I thought about it, but then I realized God's called me to preach the gospel. I don't want to spend the best years of my life in court distracted from preaching the gospel. And what profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? So I basically just walked away and kept on preaching. I know some of you might think that's crazy, but I know that life, I came from that life, and they're all miserable, and they're all fighting and clawing and miserable for money or for fame or for fortune. If you want happiness, it comes from Jesus. And you can have that tonight before you leave by asking. You can do the same thing I did up in the cave. You can just take the word of God, believe its promises, and he'll give you a new heart, he'll forgive your sins, and he'll give you a purpose for living. Would you like to have that gift? Would you like to have a real treasure that doesn't pass away? You don't get more famous than being a child of God. You don't get more rich than having a golden streets to walk on someday. Amen? If that's your desire, let's stand together and we'll close with prayer. Dear loving Father, we're so thankful for the hope and the purpose that Jesus gives us. We're so thankful for the power of your word that changes lives. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless each of these dear people that have been coming to this seminar. Pour out your spirit in their hearts. Help them to recognize that you have a great plan for their lives. And prepare us for Jesus' soon return. We ask, Lord, that you'll continue to bless this study seminar that's going on. Bring even more people. We pray that there'll be just a revival of truth that will spread through this city and help us to be part of that answer. We commit ourselves to you right now, Lord. Come into our hearts, forgive our sins, and help us to live for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.